If you want to know more about Jigsaw's backstory, like the details only included in the comic, and if you want to see the full chronology of what I think is the only accurate timeline of the events of John Kramer's life on the internet, then stick around to the end of this video. Many of my favorite horror villains are not monsters in the typical sense of having a scary appearance or intimidating demeanor, but instead project more of a psychological horror, oftentimes brought on by a distorted sense of how they see the world. Many of the best antagonists or antiheroes are scary to me because they actually believe that they're doing the world a service with their misdeeds. And the agent of the events that we've come to know as the Saw franchise is a model example of this chilling behavior. Welcome to Horror History, my name is very f***ing confused. My name is very f***ing confused, what's your name? And in today's lesson, I'll be be analyzing the man responsible for years of citywide panic, a slew of impersonators, a cult of nefarious followers, a massive federal investigation, and most significantly, the deaths of at least 57 victims. I am of course referring to the Jigsaw killer, John Kramer, most commonly known by the nickname Jigsaw, which was originally derived from his practice of cutting jigsaw pieces from the flesh of his failed victims as a symbol for the missing piece of their survival instinct. In this video, we're going to look at Jigsaw's entire life and put together those pieces. And as with any puzzle, the best way to start is by figuring out the adjacent pieces, the corner pieces, such as John Kramer's past. We'll also explore the mysteries of his background, the development of his psychopathy, the imposition of a god complex with the religious parallels in his work, and finally, the realization of his ultimate failure. So in order to understand how the puzzle that is John Kramer was built, let's take it all the way back to his birth. John Kramer was born in the year 1954, a fact we're able to derive from the mention of his age at the time of death. Subject's name is John Kramer, a 52-year-old male Caucasian. So he was only in his early 50s during the Saw movies? Yikes. With a capital yikes. Like, the whole thing is capital. John's work consisted of a company he founded called the Urban Renewal Group, but despite how it sounds, this had nothing to do with mid-2000s hip-hop. John was a civil engineer who worked alongside a lawyer named Art Blank to build homes for low-income families and also sometimes created other buildings with the intent of helping people. John was extremely intelligent, making him a world-class engineer, but he was also great at understanding people and anticipating their actions, which made him quite successful on the business end as well. He was quickly able to scale Urban Renewal Group to the point that he owned several buildings throughout the city, and he had a fair amount of resources. Sources, which he channeled back into helping the people of that city. The desire to help and improve people's lives was the first key moment to understand his motivation, because it was this that drove his actions throughout his entire life. I would also speculate that it was the reason he fell in love with the woman that would become his wife, Jill Tuck, the doctor who ran a recovery center for drug addicts known as Homeward Bound Clinic. The clinic's motto was cherish your life, a phrase that John would also associate with his own work. John and Jill's love eventually led to marriage and plans to have a first child. Like in his work, John meticulously planned all aspects of his life and the baby was no exception. The child's name, Gideon, was also the name of his first building, the Gideon Meatpacking Plant, and may have drawn from the Hebrew name Gidon, which meant hero or judge, showing us John's subconscious desire to judge people for their sins. The baby's planned date of birth was in 1995, the Chinese Year of the Pig, which was a symbol of rebirth, a concept that John believed heavily in. The name Gideon and the pig symbol would have greater meaning later in John's story, but for now, he was focused on tending to his pregnant wife. He would wait for her to get done with work some days, and he noticed some shady characters who were patients at the clinic. One evening, he has to intervene when a fight nearly breaks out between two addicts named Cecil Adams and Gus Colyard, and John had to convince Cecil to put his knife away before things got much worse. This causes John to wonder how effective his wife's rehabilitation methods really are, but he still encourages her work, something he would come to regret later down the line. He also displays evidence that he's become more jaded towards the world when he meets an insurance mogul named William Easton, who sponsors a party at Jill's clinic. They seem to connect over their mutual need to predict human behavior in their respective jobs, but John disagrees with William's methods of trying to screen people and determine their probability of illness before giving them insurance coverage. But you're not taking into consideration the most important human element of all. Which is what? The will to live. This exchange would be another important puzzle piece in crafting the Jigsaw persona, because John believed that he was giving each of his victims a chance to survive by putting them through adversity. As Gideon's due date got closer though, John continued to prepare for the birth of his son by constructing a crib, a children's toy that resembled a ventriloquist doll, which he would name Billy the Puppet, and by creating a home video for the boy during an ultrasound monitoring. Again, we can pull a couple puzzle pieces from John's preparation to be a father. The messages he meant to save for his son were to be passed via videotape, and he would eventually use this medium to speak to his test subjects, while the puppet would be reimagined as the face of Jigsaw, an avatar that appeared in some of the tapes who would sometimes make physical appearances to carry on messages to his victims. No, that's not creepy at all. Unfortunately, before John ever got to meet his son Gideon, tragedy would strike on one fateful night.
One evening in late 1994, John warms up the car while his pregnant wife closes up the clinic and notices a distressed Cecil Adams burst out of the building. He immediately knows something is wrong and goes in to find Jill collapsed on the floor after having been hit by the swinging door when Cecil had broken in. Jill was seven months pregnant at this point, so fearing for the baby's safety, he rushes her to a hospital. John suffers a long evening of emotional suffering and Jill is shell-shocked after doctors are unable to save the baby. This is the beginning of John's descent, his downward spiral, if you will, into becoming a psychopath. Path. The most common characteristic of a psycho is lack of empathy for their victims or remorse for their actions, and we see the very beginning of this right after the loss of Gideon when John changes his attitude towards the drug addicts that he previously encouraged the idea of helping. All I wanted to do was help them. You can't help them. They have to help themselves. Trauma-induced psychopathy is one of the three major ways known to develop the condition. And for John, losing the son he had already committed so much devotion to was the distressing catalyst that set things into motion. We see how much it affected him by the fact that he buried Gideon and marked the spot of the tombstone, a practice not normally used for a miscarriage. Even those closest to him, like his wife and his business partner, were not in contact with him, which worried them. They decided to get together to confront him and find him sleeping in a chair at his workshop in Gideon Meatpacking Plants. He's very unwelcoming towards them, showing no desire to return to his normal life. Art encourages him to channel his negative energy into their urban renewal project, where his designs would have been used to help low-income families. But he forfeits his shares in the company to Jill and angrily tells them to get out. He had accomplished many things at this point in his life, but none of them had been enough to save his family from the unpredictable crimes of a drug addict. And in his depressed mindset, he forced himself to come up with a solution to people like Cecil. It was the only way he knew how to cope with the loss. He would use the concept of they have to help themselves in his work, and in his deranged state, he figured the first person he should give that opportunity to was his son's killer. He tracks down Cecil during a celebration of the Chinese New Year, which, knowing John, was likely the planned due date of Gideon. To disguise himself, he steals a pig mask. Remember, it was the year of the pig. I'm just glad he upgraded to something a little bit more spooky later on, because if I saw my kidnapper wearing this, I'd probably just start losing it. Like, what are you gonna do? Force me to star in children's daytime television programming? Actually, that does sound horrifying. But another reason it makes sense for him to use the pig mask was that the pig in the Chinese zodiac represented rebirth, and he viewed his games as a chance for victims to be reborn as better people. He chloroformed Cecil, who next awakens in John's workshop. It's you! You, you did this to me. No. You did this to yourself. Yeah, come on, Cecil, you did this. It was all you, buddy. <laughs> He's delusional. Cecil is trapped in the knife chair. John claims it was a tool to reclaim his life. If he can press his face through a barrier of eight knives and press a lever on the other side, his restraints will be released. John thinks this is fitting because it will make Cecil's face ugly to match his greedy soul. Cecil is able to release himself from the chair, but this is not enough to rehabilitate him. He tries to attack John, who sidesteps and sends him tumbling into the razor wire trap. In this one, he's unable to escape. John may have told himself that letting Cecil die after giving him a second chance was a good thing, that Cecil was unable to be rehabilitated, and so killing him was just. Another trait of a psychopath is the need for repeated stimulation. Because John felt that he was doing Cecil a favor by putting him through his test, he soon had the desire to help more people and began to create more complex traps in his workshop. But John's good intentions would not be enough to make future traps fair or just, and before long, police would recognize Kramer's actions as the work of a serial killer. The newspapers started calling him the Jigsaw Killer. Hoping to do something about the decline of her marriage after losing the baby she was carrying, Jill decided to try to talk to John and give him one more chance, so she goes back into the workshop. Before finding her husband, she discovers reconnaissance photos of Cecil Adams. Cecil was believed to be missing, and Jill wondered if John had anything to do with it. He finds her snooping around and becomes very angry with her, telling her not to ever come back, effectively the end of their relationship, and another sign of psychopathic behavior, impulsivity. They would get divorced not long after. After Jill leaves, he goes back to work on another trap, the glass coffin. This box would allow the user to be transported out of a collapsing room and brought to safety. John wouldn't survive long enough to use this trap himself. Instead, it would be used years later by his successor. But the fact that he was working on it way back in the 90s is a testament to John's intelligence and ability to predict possible outcomes, one of the things that makes him so dangerous as a serial killer. Despite his impressive intellect, his physical condition was about to worsen, as John was diagnosed with colon cancer not long after the divorce.
Between the divorce and the cancer diagnosis, this was two straight tragedies for John. The cancer got to him while he was already at the lowest of low points, and as a result, he decided to end his life. He decides to do this Groundhog Day style by driving his car off a cliff, but miraculously, he survives the wreck. As he's lying there in the smoking mess, he realizes that he wants to live, and in order to do so, he must endure a little more pain by pulling a stake out of himself to escape. Not only was this a revelation for John in that he got to experience firsthand how testing his own will to live had supposedly healed his mind and given him a newfound appreciation for life, but it also may have inspired him to directly create the spike trap, a trap that would be used years later and required a victim to remove metal stakes from herself in order to escape, and the horsepower trap, where a victim literally experiences a car crash. Here? The mother After walking away from his self-imposed car wreck, his faith in the rehabilitation method he had tried on Cecil was restored. And he may have realized that the pain factor would need to be amplified, because in order for it to work, the traps would need to test the very fabric of human nature. He got to work on some new traps as he was treated at the Angel of Mercy Hospital, where he ended up being unsatisfied with the hospitality of almost everyone working there, and marked them in his mind as future victims to be rehabilitated. The people he encountered there were mostly just doing their jobs, but because John was becoming more frustrated by the tragedies of his life, he was looking too hard for victims to punish by finding reasons that weren't really there. Over the course of the next five to seven years, John began to pay more attention to the world around him as he continued to receive chemotherapy for his colon cancer. He came to meet some of the other people who he deemed unappreciative of their lives and planned to include them in his upcoming test game. A game, in his eyes, was a series of different traps involving multiple people that was supposed to add a social experiment element to his patented rehabilitation process. Okay, it wasn't really patented. I just thought that word sounded good there, to be honest. He had hoped to do more than simply spend his time testing a series of individuals until his time on this earth expired. Instead, he wanted to create a long-lasting societal change that would impact people long after his passing by running his games and letting a survivor go on to tell the tale of their trial. When news of the horrors they experienced broke, others would be less likely to make the same mistake out of fear of becoming the next victim. John wanted to turn one random act of supposed vigilante justice into an entire movement, but soon found it could be even more than that. He decided to hold his first game as a test, and so created it and ran it in secret at a remote location, an abandoned pig farm that was still owned by his wife's family. He thought this was the perfect choice because it fit his idea of the pig icon representing rebirth. Some of the victims of this test game were people in his life at the time. This first game was a bit different than the others, in that it was more about getting the victims to admit the mistakes of their past. The later games were more about putting the perpetrators in physical pain, which is usually somehow symbolic of their wrongdoing. There would be five players included in the barn game. There was Ryan, whose foolish actions got his friends killed back in high school, Carly, a thief who caused her victim to have an asthma attack, Mitch, who sold a faulty motorcycle, resulting in the death of John's nephew, Anna, who was John's next door neighbor and was normally very supportive of him while going through the chemotherapy, but who also killed her baby and blamed it on her sleeping husband, and Logan Nelson, a resident of the Angel of Mercy Hospital who accidentally switched the labels of John's brain scan with that of another patient, which delayed the diagnosis of a tumor on John's brain. As a result of this, he wasn't correctly diagnosed until 2003, and by that point, it's too late. The physicians working on his case, Dr. Lawrence Gordon and Dr. Lynn Denlin, were cold and unsympathetic towards him during his treatment, and John did not like the way that Dr. Gordon told him how long he had to live. He planned to possibly test the two doctors in future games, but for now, he had collected enough players to run his test game. So he collected them, brought them to the Tuck Pig Farm, and John Kramer's first experiment began. Any attempt to violate my rules will kill you. I want to play a game. When the game begins, John keeps track of the progress of each player by monitoring the rooms with security cameras. Later iterations of the games would have him physically present to make sure that the rules of each game are followed. So I'm guessing that technology was used here in the test game because two of the contestants, Anna and Logan, already knew who John Kramer was. Hello, Anna. Each player wakes up with a bucket on their head and is instructed to make a blood sacrifice, but Logan didn't wake up at the same time as the others, giving him an unfair disadvantage. John recognizes this and doesn't think it would be right for Logan to die because of a small mistake, so he stops the spinning saw blades and bails him out. Logan had suffered large lacerations across his back, but with John's help, he's able to have them stitched up and he survives. From there, the rest of the game plays out as planned until there are only two survivors remaining, Anna and Ryan. Wearing the updated version of the pig mask, John re-enters the game and once more sedates them. While they're unconscious, he moves them to another part of the barn called the Slaughter Room. If you're wondering if there's a reason that it's called that, there is. And there's about to be a second one. Ryan and Anna are locked to opposite sides of the room, and John finally reveals himself to deliver the rules of this final challenge. Now the game's simple. The best ones are. You have a one-shot gun? 
You have one shell? He doesn't specifically tell them that the gun is configured backwards. The theme of this game from the beginning was for them to find salvation by looking inwards. While I am certain that there is a desire to point fingers at me for the blood that has been shed, unless you turn that finger inward, I assure you, more blood will be lost. The same principle ends up applying for the gun. Now, if you want to achieve your freedom, you have to learn. You have to realize that you've been doing it backwards. So when Anna fails to take these clues into consideration and tries killing Ryan with the gun, she ends up shooting herself. The key that would have released them was also hidden in the bullet casing left inside of the gun, so it's destroyed when Anna shoots it, and so are Ryan's chances of ever escaping. That leaves only one survivor of the test game, Logan Nelson, and he would actually be the one to give shape to the next piece of the jigsaw puzzle. Let's just go back one moment to the point where John Kramer reveals himself in a game for the first time. When he comes out to address Ryan and Anna, he's wearing a new costume, a hooded robe that almost makes him look like a monk or priest. This pig farm was no temple, but the attire does lead me to the next piece of the jigsaw puzzle, the religious aspect of John's teachings. When I said he was creating a movement, it wasn't only about scaring the citizens into behaving as he wants them to based on the cautionary tales of the survivors, but he also wants to develop his own cult, his own group of followers that would pass down his teachings and eventually take over for him when who was gone. In order to truly change the world, he would have to create something that would still inspire this behavior for future generations, and the only way to do that was for his followers to pass down his values. The first step to doing this is by painting himself as a religious leader by wearing these robes. In doing so, he started to see himself as a god. As discussed in the horror history episode on Mark Hoffman, a god complex is an unshakable belief characterized by consistently inflated feelings of personal ability, privilege, or infallibility. In other words, he thinks he can do no wrong. The religious attire was kind of a final step towards John truly believing that he was a god. And according to psychologist and author Harold Kaplan's definition of a god complex, Jigsaw's behavior fits it to a T. A person with a god complex may refuse to admit the possibility of their error or failure, even in the face of irrefutable evidence and intractable problems. In John's case, look no further than his previous trap with Cecil Adams. He believed that if Cecil suffered through the knife chair, he would be instantly rehabilitated. But he wasn't. He still tried to attack John after escaping. But even after seeing that go down, John refused refuses to believe that his methods are faulty, and continues with his plans to create new traps. I also think it's no coincidence that Cecil's surname is Adams. Cecil is John's first victim to be punished for wrongdoing, and in the biblical story of Adam and Eve, Adam is the one to take the forbidden fruit, which gets them banned from the Garden of Eden. I'm not really sure how I how to say this, but I just have to say this so that no one makes the same mistake I have done. I'm not sure how many of you know this, but I've actually been permanently banned for life. Other indicators of a god complex include a person highly dogmatic in their views, meaning the person speaks of their personal opinions as though they were unquestionably correct. Just listen to the way that John addresses his victims, in a booming godlike voice might I add, as if his judgments of them are completely irrefutable. You deny culpability, no doubt, for the circumstances in which you find yourselves. Salvation can be yours if you cleanse yourselves of the habitual lies which have brought you here. He even speaks using language that you might find in religious texts when addressing his victims. The final indicator of a god complex is exhibiting no regard for the conventions and demands of society. They may request special consideration or privileges. John's methods are against the law, obviously. He would soon start holding more public-facing games, but since he views what he's doing as morally just, he disregards the rules of our society. Get his ass out of here. Actually, I will need to remain here while you deal with your problem, Detective Matthews. So John is a textbook example of someone with a god complex, but a religion cannot work with only a god or a leader. It also requires followers, and John had already found his first one. After saving Logan Nelson from the barn game, he takes him under his wing and trains him in the ways of Jigsaw. He explains the basic concepts upon which he operates. Many religions use some kind of text or commandments to impress a moral code on their followers. Jigsaw's games each have rules, and the ideals expressed in these tapes serve as the religious text, the main method of John Kramer's teachings. Most religious texts date back thousands of years or more, and John's teachings gain a similar immortality when a website is founded to spread his word even after his death. Uh, 
Logan, you ever heard of a website called Jigsaw Rules? It's a site devoted to Jigsaw. And of course, the most important part of the cult of Jigsaw, and the Saw franchise in general, is the traps. In religion, there are usually abstract concepts of sin leading to punishment. Popular ones include heaven and hell, while others use a system of karma and reincarnation. John's religion kind of combines both ideas. The traps cause suffering as a form of punishment for those who have sinned, but he views his suffering as transformative. He thinks the survivors of his traps are reborn as better people. And that leads us back to Logan Nelson, who had become the first disciple of Jigsaw. John taught him everything that he believed in, and also shared some of his knowledge in the field of mechanical engineering. Together, they created what would become Jigsaw's signature trap, the Reverse Bear Trap. The partnership would be short-lived, however, because Nelson had to go overseas to fight in the war, so John would have to look elsewhere to find more potential to disciples. As he is still working to fight off the cancer, he discovers someone who he thinks could potentially have what it takes to be one of his followers. It all begins when John is doing some of his own research on an alternate treatment, and discovers a doctor in Norway who's been administering an experimental therapy with a 30-40% to 40 success rate. He goes to visit his healthcare provider, Umbrella Health, which is run by William Easton, the man who had once sponsored the party at Jill's clinic. He explains the situation and requests coverage, but William gives him this copy-and-paste answer about how his doctor would already be using the treatment if it worked, how it's not feasible with John's insurance policy, and that if he seeks this treatment out independently, he'll be dropped from his current coverage. John responds with one of my favorite lines that I always make sure to quote if I ever have to go to the doctor. Whenever it's time to pay, the receptionist will just be like, okay, CZ's world, that's $50,000, and then I just do my best John Kramer voice and say, you know, in the Far East, people pay their doctors when they're healthy. And then she's like, what? And I say, you think it's the living that will have ultimate judgment over you. No, but I think the reason John reacts the way he does to Mr. Easton is more out of principle, to make a point about the healthcare system rather than than for personal reasons. And I think he knew he was going to die before long, and he had the money to seek out other treatments, but he wanted his legacy to say something about society, which is, again, something that a religious icon might do. Later that year, things would get worse with his health once again, and it was time to unleash the Jigsaw icon out into the world. The public was about to learn of Jigsaw for the first time. In June of 2003, Dr. Lawrence Gordon diagnosed John with an inoperable frontal lobe tumor or glioblastoma multiform of the left temporal lobe. In other words, he had a very fast-spreading brain cancer. He underwent chemotherapy to try to kill the cancer cells and external beam radiation therapy to try to remove the tumor. Nine months later, on March 24, 2004, John was found to have progressive aphasia and right-sided hemoplegia. This means the brain cancer was affecting his ability to speak and limiting his ability to move the right side of his body. See, we're learning science here in the horror history classroom. This show is educational, guys. It's not just memes. It's not just memes. <laughs> Wait till you see the f <laughs> No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, fine, but my point is, it's not all memes. John was examined again, and Dr. Gordon and Dr. Denlin discovered a mass on his left temporal lobe, causing his brainstem to compress. The cancer was also metastatic, meaning it was moving to different parts of the brain, or possibly different parts of the body. A further brain scan indicated signs of necrosis. His brain cells were going to die as a side effect of the radiation therapy, which was meant to kill the cancer cells, but didn't necessarily distinguish between good and bad cells. In addition to that, he exhibited edema, so his brain was swelling inside of his skull, forcing them to perform a craniotomy, a brain surgery that requires them to create a surgical opening through his skull. If you weren't paying attention through most of that medical jargon, basically all you need to know was that your boy was sick and Dr. Denlin told him that there's no preventative treatment for what you have, in a very cold and clinical tone. John didn't appreciate that a whole lot. His brain may have had a recurring tumor, but it didn't seem to affect his memory, as he would file Dr. Denlin's lack of empathy away in his mind to make her another possible test subject in the future. In the meantime, however, Dr. Gordon and Dr. Denlin were able to improve his condition enough so he could be released from the hospital to enjoy what time he had left at home. However, he had other ideas of how he wanted to spend his precious hours. Ironically, we don't actually see his first public victims, even though this area between March 2004 and October 2004 has been covered to death in the movies, but basically what we do know is that there were at least three or so traps that were held in which none of the victims made it. The reason I think this is because the next death that we do see is the death of Seth Baxter in the Pendulum Trap, which was created by Detective Mark Hoffman to make it look like Seth was another victim of Jigsaw. But in order for this copycat crime to make sense, that means there had to have have been other jigsaw traps that were discovered by the public in the first place, even though we don't see them on this list of jigsaw victims in Saw 5. Maybe there's another page to this list that we don't see, or maybe they were all so badly mutilated that they could not be identified. It certainly wasn't because the creators of this franchise are human and a mistake was made. In these first three public victims, a few conventions are established, like the use of a pre-recorded tape featuring Billy the Puppet reading the rules of each trap out to the victim, the idea that John is physically present at the site of each test, and the fact that a jigsaw puzzle piece is cut out of the flesh 
of each subject. As a result of this, the police and the press coined the name Jigsaw, and John became known as the Jigsaw Killer. My name's John. How do you like to be called Jigsaw? <laughs> It was the police and the press who coined the nickname Jigsaw. I never encouraged or claimed that. The Jigsaw piece I cut from my subjects was only ever meant to be a symbol that that subject was missing something. Mark Hoffman used these elements in his copycat Jigsaw trap, but John had already been keeping an eye on him for other reasons, so he found out immediately, and decided to test him as well in a crude trap called the shotgun chair, which prevented Hoffman from moving his arms if he didn't want to you know, blow his head off. The reason that Hoffman is tested is because he didn't give his subject a second chance. Everybody deserves a chance. And you get a chance. And you get a chance. Hoffman is gonna get one too because John realizes that the two of them are not too far apart in their intentions. They both want to bring justice to the city, but John believes he has a better way of going about it because of his god complex. So he brings Hoffman on as his next disciple. To make sure he stays in line, John threatens that the truth about Hoffman being Seth Baxter's killer will automatically be released if anything happens to him. So Hoffman is forced to work under John, and John hopes that this will help him see the light, and he starts to agree with John's methods. In order to start this transformation, John takes Hoffman along as he sets up the next two traps. The two of them would double-team a man named Paul Leahy, and leave him in the razor wire maze trap. Paul was a former addict that John had first met at Jill's clinic, and he had since turned to cutting himself to feed his addiction. The maze seemed to be an updated version of Cecil's second trap, and Paul was required to crawl through, thus cutting himself again to get out. The irony is that if you want to die, you just have to stay where you are. But if you want to live, you'll have to cut yourself again. The hope was that this more painful punishment would get Paul to appreciate the life that he had, but it was once again in vain, and Paul was unable to survive. The crime scene was quote unquote investigated by Hoffman, but the deputy coroner on the police force, Allison Carey, introduced two new investigators to the equation, Stephen Singh and David Tapp. Jigsaw would keep tabs on them from here on out, and later decided to make them future Jigsaw victims. Before this, I think you could make the argument at least that everyone he had tested, even if you don't want to say they deserved it, they were bad people. Not including Nelson, who didn't really end up getting tested. But Singh and Tap only end up on Jigsaw's naughty list because they're trying to bring a serial killer to justice. This is both the psychopathy and the god complex inside of John really taking over and skewing his perception of reality. These two psychological conditions cause him to invent reasons to punish Singh and Tap so that nobody can stop him. He tried to tell himself that they deserve to be tested because they valued the glory of catching Jigsaw over the preservation of human life, but it was really just an excuse to strike down those who opposed him. So the god complex told him that nobody should threaten his power, but his psychopathy Pathy told him that he was doing the right thing by putting them through nearly inescapable tests. John set up a new workshop in an abandoned mannequin factory on Stygian Street. There, he would work on the creation of his next major game, the bathroom game, and he would create a trap for Sing and Tap so that they would be killed if they tried to confront or stop him. He does this by filming the videotapes he plays for his victims in front of recognizable graffiti to lure the two cops into his territory, but they would not show up there for at least a few weeks. In the meantime, he had another subject to test, and once again enlisted the help of Hoffman. The victim was named Mark Wilson. John John found out that Mark was faking an illness in order to scam others, so he tests him using the flammable jelly trap. Mark needed to obtain the combination to a safe containing an antidote using a candle to read the clues hidden on the walls. The floor was covered in sharp glass, and one wrong move would ignite the flammable jelly smeared all over his body. That is why it's called the flammable jelly trap. After setting this trap up, Hoffman tries to warn John that Tap is onto him, but John, being the manipulative mastermind that he already is, is already one step ahead of him. One day during his treatment at the Angel of Mercy Hospital, John steals a pen light from his oncologist, Dr. Gordon, and passes it on to Hoffman, instructing him to leave it behind at the flammable jelly trap crime scene in order to throw the other investigators off. The plan worked, and it gave John a little bit more freedom when it came to his next trap, which would involve two more former patients of the Homeward Bound Clinic. This trap would take place in May of 2004, five months before the events of the bathroom game. That was five months ago. And the players this time were two drug addicts named Amanda Young and Donnie Greco. This was another example of Jigsaw believing his judgments are supreme, but in reality, the scenario he creates is unfair. Amanda is told she must retrieve the key from the stomach of her dead cellmate in order to remove the reverse bear trap and prevent it from tearing open her head. However, when she begins, she finds that Donnie is not actually dead, just paralyzed. But she has to kill him to get the key. We're not even at the start of the first movie yet, and John's already breaking his own rules, and very loudly yelled ones at that. Everybody deserves a chance! As 
I discussed in my Saw episode of Things You Missed, it is possible that Donnie already had a second chance in a trap of his own off screen somewhere. But what's most likely happening here is that Jigsaw has developed a bit of a taste for violence through his previous victims. It's another trait of the psychopath, the need for stimulation. Ironically, this makes him no better than the addicts that he's so keen on punishing. Because they're addicted to drugs, and he's essentially addicted to putting people in traps. He's made himself the judge, jury, and executioner, and he's begun to take joy in the power that this gives him. What makes him even more dangerous is the fact that he's super intelligent, and knows that he has to be sneaky about what he's doing in order for it to continue. At this point, Jigsaw is already a full-fledged monster. After Amanda unlocks the reverse bear trap from her head, Billy the Puppet wheels up on a tricycle and congratulates her. Congratulations. You are still alive. Most people are so ungrateful to be alive, but not you. Not anymore. John waits in her apartment for her to get home and tells her not to be afraid because her life has just begun. Amanda would become his next disciple. She was the first survivor of a game to actually believe that the experience had helped her overcome something, and felt that her days of taking drugs were behind her now that she came to appreciate life. For this reason, John saw great potential in her to be the one to continue his work, so he began to work more closely with her as he developed his next game, hoping to hone her skills and get her up to speed with Hoffman. Two weeks later, in mid to late May, John predicts that Sing and Tap are close to discovering his workshop. He may have known this because of his excellent ability to anticipate the actions of others, but may have also been aided by Hoffman, who was still a police officer and may have been looking over Tap's shoulder to warn John about when he was getting close. He starts wearing a bulletproof vest round under his robes as a precaution, and kidnaps a man named Jeff Reidenauer. The reason that Jigsaw wanted to test Jeff is unknown, because his tape is never discovered. However, if we use the non-canon video game Saw 2 Flesh and Blood as a clue, it would seem that Jeff had attempted suicide, and thus, John felt that he did not cherish his life. He imprisons Jeff in a trap known as the Drill Chair, and waits for Sing and Tap to find him. One day when he walks into his workshop, he realizes that someone has been there, and prepares for a confrontation. He starts the Drill Chair by stepping on a switch on the ground, and explains that it will kill Jeff in 20 seconds if the detectives can't find the key. So basically, they have to choose between saving his life and capturing Jigsaw. This is another example of him bending his own rules to benefit himself. Unless there's some off-screen scene with Jeff failing his first test, he's not really being given a second chance. Everybody deserves a chance. He also claims that he despises murder. Killing is distasteful. Okay, calm down, dude. If you wake up your parents, the sleepover is going to be over. But the fact that John physically starts a machine designed to drill through Jeff's head is no different than him pulling a trigger and shooting someone. I've never murdered anyone in my life. The decisions are up to them. From what we can tell, Jeff never really had the option to escape as many of the others did. Because if somebody else were doing this, John would see it as unjust. But because Sing and Tap are coming after him and he views himself as a god, he'll break any rules he wants to bring them down. My favorite example of a god complex in fiction is Light Yagami from Death Note, and we see a similar thing happen with him. He starts off by only killing criminals, but then he tries to kill the detective, L, who was trying to bring him to justice. Jigsaw's way of testing the two cops is to see if they try to save Jeff or capture Jigsaw. Sing focuses on freeing the victim, but Tap goes after John and as a result, fails the test and gets his throat slashed. Then, Singh makes the same mistake and goes after John, probably not wanting the mission to have been in vain. But John, who was always prepared for any scenario, was prepared for this, too. Singh chases him down the stairs into a hallway, where the quadruple gun trap is set up. This one is pretty simple. If you trip a hidden fishing wire, these guns hidden overhead will kill you. John steps over the wire safely, and Singh shoots him with his own gun. John's bulletproof vest absorbs the gunshot, but he wisely stays on the ground and waits for Singh to approach, trip the wire, and get himself killed. <laughs> before getting back up and fleeing the workshop for good. I think one of the reasons that he believed he'd be able to pull something like this off was that he had endured so much pain from his cancer treatment that getting knocked to the ground with a gunshot impact, even at the frail age of 50 at this point, was not much in comparison. He expresses a similar sentiment during another game a year later. I don't intend to mock you, officer, but I'm a cancer patient. How could you possibly put me in any more pain than I'm already in? Detective Tap ends up surviving the throat slash, so John has to abandon his workshop at the Mannequin Factory and relocate to a property that would later be called the Nerve Gas House. I would theorize that this was part of the Urban Renewal Project, the housing project he abandoned at the end of his engineering career. There seem to be several of these houses throughout the city, but this particular one has been outfitted with a network of underground tunnels and hidden rooms, and one of these rooms was a dilapidated bathroom that John had perfectly configured to be the site of the next big game.
If Jigsaw's life is a puzzle, a combination of the various pieces that make up his identity, we need to assemble those pieces in order to fully understand him. The same approach can be taken to understand some of his games. The Barn game brought together people who had wronged others but refused to admit their mistakes and seek a confession from each of them. They were all unified by that, but were otherwise not connected in any significant way. So for John's next game, the bathroom game of October 2004, he strategically chose subjects who were all different pieces of the same puzzle, and the centerpiece that connected to all of the other others was his oncologist at the Angel of Mercy Hospital, Dr. Lawrence Gordon. The first subject that John captured for this game was named Zepp Hindle. He was an orderly at the hospital, who actually cared for John a lot and treated him very well. But unfortunately for him, John kind of needed him to make the whole thing work. We don't find out why Zepp was tested by Jigsaw, however, this is another one where we can turn to the supplemental non-canon material for possible clues. Saw Rebirth was a comic, and eventually motion comic, that aimed to give a little more backstory about John Kramer. This isn't an official entry in the series, because it does kind contradict details from some of the movies, but I think it's relatively harmless to use its explanation of why Jigsaw decided to test Zep. I'm gonna roll the clip, but as a fair warning, the casting of the voices isn't the best. The first voice you're gonna hear is supposed to be Zep, and the narrator is John Kramer. So with that in mind, let's roll the clip. Remember the doc was a real shoulder to cry on, huh? Cold, haunted bastards, a lot of them. What are you talking about? They're all screwing around on their wives. I sure won't be that way when I'm a doctor. The orderly had issues of his own. Now that my own life was slipping away, I paid closer attention to the lives of others. So it seems like Zep's big flaw was that he was a gossip. Jigsaw injects him with the poison and forces him to help facilitate the game if he wants to get the antidote. Zep was most likely responsible for the kidnapping of Dr. Gordon, while Amanda's job was to get Adam Stanhite. Adam was a photographer hired by Detective Tapp to spy on Gordon because Tapp suspected Gordon of being Jigsaw. Before Amanda abducted him though, John performs a ceremony to celebrate her rebirth. The ceremony seems to be another example of John trying to make his MO into a religious experience experience. He dons the black and red robes yet again in a candlelit room and asks her to essentially make vows of devotion to him. Interestingly, in the Saw 3 official soundtrack, the music that plays during the scene is called Baptism. And if you listen closely, there's a choral chant in the background, giving the feeling of a church choir. He leaves Amanda to it and heads to the bathroom to make the final preparations. When she shows up with the unconscious Adam, he pauses the glam and gore tutorial he was watching. He instructs her on what to do with Adam as he pours a bucket of fake blood onto the ground and prepares himself for his most ambitious game yet. It's time to start our game. Oh boy, I'll get the controllers. I won't play your game. I won't! Oh uh, wait, I think I misunderstood. John injects himself with a serum that is supposed to slow down his heart rate, relax his muscles, and make him less noticeable as he pretends, keyword, pretends to be dead on the floor in the middle of the bathroom. And Amanda takes all of the other materials, hits the light, and closes the door on Lawrence, Adam, and John, who has a gun in his left hand and a tape recorder in the other. It would seem that he's also hiding a small remote in his palm or something that has the ability to send a shock to Adam or Lawrence all Jose Altuve style. The goal for Lawrence in this game was to kill Adam before time runs out, and the goal for Adam was just to escape. He was tested because he spent more and more time spying on other people rather than examining his own life. Adam and Gordon are supposed to be enemies in this game, but they try to secretly work together to escape, not knowing that the man in the center of the room is alive, listening, and also the man responsible for their imprisonment. So when they develop a plan to make it look like Lawrence had killed Adam with the poison to try to fool Zepp, who is watching via the camera, it doesn't work, because John hears everything that they said and shocks Adam to show Zepp that he wasn't really dead. Later, when Lawrence seems to have lost all hope, Jigsaw gives him a buzz. <laughs> which I saw as him trying one last ditch effort to reinvigorate Gordon's passion, to make him stop feeling sorry for himself and to ignite a fury to motivate him to try to pass his test. I'd say it works. Okay, fine, roll the clip one last time. <laughs> that never gets old. Gordon ends up cutting off his own foot to escape the shackle, and in one desperate, final attempt to save his family, pretends to kill Adam again, this time using the gun. I find it very interesting that John doesn't use the electric shock again to test if Adam is really dead. It might be that he actually doesn't suspect it. The first time, he knew to be skeptical, because he could hear Lawrence and Adam whispering to each other in the dark. But on the second attempt, I'm pretty sure that Dr. Gordon just gives Adam a wink. I've theorized that it's while his head is turned away from the camera right here. John has to keep his eyes closed, so he doesn't know that this was another 
fake out attempt. And Lawrence's acting was good enough to sell that it was real. I know there are going to be people who think it's out of character for someone as smart as John to be fooled like that, so if you have your own theory as to why he didn't shock Adam right here, let me know in the comments. At the end of the game, Dr. Gordon is the only one who manages to limp away alive, and that leaves Adam alone in the bathroom with John, who Adam still believes to be dead. Then this happens. <laughs> I swear, this isn't the beginning of a mattress commercial, this is actually what happens, and if you do get a mattress commercial, I swear, it's a complete coincidence. Did you know that the wrong mattress protector can ruin the feel of your mattress? After getting to his feet, Jigsaw informs Adam that the key to his chain was inside the bathtub, which was now unreachable because the tub had drained. Adam tries to grab Zep's gun off the ground to attack Jigsaw, but one last electric shock sends it flying from his hands. Game over. John was now out of danger, but he was not done with his tasks for that evening. He leaves the bathroom to go find Dr. Gordon. After seeing the way that the doctor had handled the situation under pressure, he realized that he would be an excellent ally, and having passed his test, he'd be a prime candidate to become a new disciple. He catches up to him, and finds him on the verge of passing out because of the blood loss. John splashes some water on his face while congratulating him on surviving. He helps clean up the wound, and eventually physically rehabilitates him, giving him a prosthetic foot and taking him on as the next accomplice. John would treat Dr. Gordon differently than his other students. He was already beginning to sense potential problems with Mark and Amanda, who he'd suspected of having dark ulterior motives to harm the victims of the traps rather than save them. He feared that his platform, the name Jigsaw, would be misused after his passing. So using Dr. Gordon, he set up a system of checks and balances. By keeping Gordon's involvement a secret from the other apprentices, he had a hidden weapon to help preserve his legacy. I should note that Nelson was still overseas fighting in America's Iraq war, so John didn't know if he'd be coming back or if he would be reliable anymore. At some point over the next year, Jigsaw continues carrying out smaller traps to test the people he deems to have lost their appreciation for life. One of these was a woman named Joan, who survived her trap, but decided not to become one of Jigsaw's followers for unknown reasons. She does, however, gain a stronger appreciation for her life, and tells her story on the news. That pure moment of absolute horror gave me light, and as wrong as this may seem, I'm better for enduring it. The broadcast reaches a man named Bobby Dagan, who is inspired by her transformation, and perhaps more significantly, her potential marketability. The smart thing for Bobby to do would be to get in contact with her and offer to ghostwrite a book about her jigsaw experience for a percentage of the profit. But what he does instead is write his own book, where he pretends to be a jigsaw victim. John takes issue with this for similar reasons to him taking issue with Hoffman impersonating one of his traps, and confronts him at a book signing. In ancient Egypt, if you were speaking under oath, you were required to say, if I'm lying, take me to the quarries. That mean anything to you? After getting his copy signed, John removes the cover with the photo of Bobby's face on it, telling him that he won't need it now that they've met. I think this is John's little way of telling Bobby that he's the real Jigsaw. Obviously, Bobby isn't supposed to figure it out right away, but he's basically saying that he's so intelligent that he'll always remember Bobby's face, even from such a short meeting. And he's kind of hinting that they could meet again. They don't meet again, though. The task of testing Bobby Dagan would fall on one of Jigsaw's disciples. The next big game John would plan would be even more complex than the last. This game would involve two locations, and as with the bathroom game, he planned to place himself in the center of one of them to facilitate things. He also placed Amanda in the midst of the action in the other location to make sure that the rules were followed. Around October of 2005, it was finally time for the game to take place. The first half of the game, which was created by Jigsaw, takes place in the previously mentioned Nerve Gas House, and it contains a series of criminals who all had ties to one cop named Eric Matthews. One of these criminals was a con man named Avi Tate, who John convinced to help kidnap the other seven players. Then, John brought in Hoffman to sedate and bring in Avi as the eighth and final contestant. After some finishing touches to one of the traps within the game called the Magnum Eyehole, the Nerve Gas House was ready. In this game, each member was breathing in a deadly nerve gas and was tasked with completing a trap of their own in order to win an antidote. Each of them was a real criminal who was framed for a different crime they did not commit by Eric Matthews, except for one. Daniel Matthews was Eric Matthews son. He was also a criminal, although his crimes were much more childish. Part of the game involved them all figuring out that they were tied to Matthews in some way. The second half of the game was created by Amanda. So Amanda
Amanda was inside of John's portion of the game, and John was inside Amanda's portion. The second half took place at an unused steel plant called Wilson Steel, which had been the location of John's main workshop over the past year. Amanda, possibly with the help of John, had set up video monitors of the events that had already taken place at the nerve gas house. This was the main motivation for Detective Matthews to participate in the game. He would see his son in danger and be forced to play along. To add insult to injury, he re-recorded Daniel's voicemail greeting? For each Daniel's phone, he's not in right now. But if that actually brings up a lot of questions for me. Like, did he re-record the voicemails of every victim? And if so, why wasn't that included as bonus content on the special edition DVDs of each Saw movie? Promotional DVD. Hello. You've reached the phone of Zach Morris. He's not in right now because he didn't agree with my opinion on Saw 7. Amanda is able to get Daniel through John's half of the game at the Nerve Gas House, and Daniel is stowed safely and secretly within Jigsaw's headquarters. But to lure Detective Matthews into his trap, John uses another trap, which contains a clue about the location of Jigsaw's workshop. Jigsaw would, for the first time in his known history, enlist the help of his secret asset, Dr. Lawrence Gordon, for one of his traps. The victim this time was named Michael Marks, a police informant who was another former patient of the Homeward Bound Clinic. Jigsaw felt Michael was not worthy of the life he'd been given, because as an informant, he spent all his time spying on others and had become a rat or a snitch. This shows us that Jigsaw has gone even further down the rabbit hole. John does exactly what Michael Marks does to find victims who he believes are wrongdoers. If anything, John himself is more guilty of this because of the number of people he's keeping tabs on. But his reasoning goes back, once again, to the God complex, causing him to believe that he's allowed to do it, but others, or society as a whole, is not. Michael wakes up wearing a device around his neck called the Venus Flytrap, which will clamp down and impale his face if he's unable to obtain the key, which Gordon has hidden behind his right eye. Jigsaw asks him to look inward rather than outward and give up one of the eyes that he relies so much on to spy on criminals. Michael fails his test and John takes a Jigsaw piece out of him and leaves a message behind for Detective Matthews, telling him to look closer. I also wonder if his misspelling of Matthews' last name was another sign that the brain cancer was really getting to his head. Matthews would take a closer look and discover that the victim was one of his informants and that the steel used used to construct the trap was from Wilson Steel Plant, a location that John knew Matthews was familiar with because it played a part in a case from his past. Matthews leads his team there just in time to catch a jigsaw eating his Sunday morning Cocoa Puffs. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm just imagining John Kramer doing that. <laughs> Like, just, just seeing this old cancer patient just start jumping around and losing it when he tastes the Cocoa Puffs. The SWAT team comes in and handcuffs Jigsaw. Matthews mocks him by leaning in and saying, Is this close enough? Um, yeah. Matthews orders his men to book Jigsaw, but as I mentioned earlier in this lesson, John takes control of the situation by saying he'll have to stay in place. The cops find the video monitors, and John confirms that the kid on the screens is indeed Matthews' son, Daniel. His facial expression as he does this is a sick example of how his psychotic tendencies have evolved. I spoke earlier about the increasing need for repeated stimulation sometimes seen in psychopaths. This occurs because at the beginning, John believed that he was doing the world a service by punishing criminals and other people that he's judged to have lost their way. He tortured these individuals using his traps, and so his brain came to associate doing a good thing with doing a very bad thing, putting others in pain. So as a result, he starts to like the idea of hurting his victims. It's your son Daniel, you remember him, don't you? I don't know who he is, you piece of shit. What is he doing on that monitor? Well, I haven't looked at the monitors for some time, so it would be hard for me to say. But I would imagine that um, he's cowering in a corner with a look on his face. And he has an even bigger smile on his face when he describes the torture that Daniel might be going through in detail. He has about two hours before the gas creeping into his nervous system begins to break down his body tissue and he begins to bleed from every orifice he has. <laughs> oh yes, there will be blood. I feel like there's a Paul Thomas Anderson joke to be made here, but I don't know what it is. So I'm just gonna put this humorous, if not irrelevant meme. All right, I think that's been on screen for long enough. John explains to Matthews how he can see his son again if he simply sits with John until the game ends without resorting to dirty police work such as... Evidence tampering. Ha, huh, bet you thought I was gonna say... Brutality. Matthews reluctantly agrees to sit down with Jigsaw, who tries to get through to him and make him realize the error of his past ways. For how far John has strayed from his original intention to help people, I do think that he actually does a good job during this game and doing his best to get Matthews to actually win the game. We also learn a little bit more about Jigsaw's mantra, the reason that he wants to build a following and try to 
He explains that Charles Darwin's theory of evolution no longer applies to the modern man because we live in a society where it's easy to survive without having the edge, or the will to survive. That's why John views his subjects as having not cherished their lives. Then he goes on to explain that his past with the cancer and the lost child changed that for him. But before he's able to give Matthews that same epiphany, the detective walks away in a rage. That would be the closest John would get to converting him to the Church of Jigsaw. Eric ends up resorting to destroying John's blueprints, which John points out is not the proper move from an officer who should be collecting evidence. But John really wants Eric to succeed, so he gives him another chance to turn it around. Eventually, Matthews snaps when he sees a criminal on the monitor coming after his son and decides to go to his go-to method. Brutality! He breaks John's finger, destroys the walkie-talkie, which is basically his way of saying that he won't be doing things by the book anymore, and puts his gun into John's mouth as he continually threatens him. At that point, John has seen enough. He's realized that Matthews is past the point of no return and that there is no hope for him. Game. Game over. Jigsaw realized that there was no hope for Detective Eric Matthews after he turned a violent hand against him, and decided it was time to take him to the house where the nerve gas game had been held. This was all part of his game plan though, or I guess technically Amanda's game plan, though it's hard to imagine that John didn't play a big part in it. Because John's most dangerous asset is, unlike many other horror movie villains, his intelligence. We've seen him use his masterful understanding of engineering to his advantage, but he was also helped by an impressive comprehension of the human mind. To put it into a term that I find to be almost comically appropriate, I would say that John was a master of game theory. Hello internet, welcome to Game Theory. So I've been doing some research and I found out what if Shaggy from Scooby-Doo was a stoner the whole time? <laughs> uh, no, that's offensive. I am not a stoner and don't do drugs or you might wake up with a reverse bear trap. But I recently learned that the beloved internet show Game Theory is actually named after an actual concept called Game Theory. And yes, I do plan on continuing to pronounce it like that. Game Theory is the study of how players in a game will strategize in different situations. It's basically the science of decision making. The development of Game Theory was first developed by mathematician John von Neumann to try to bolster his poker skills. John Kramer used some of those concepts to make his games adaptable to some of the most likely decisions that his players may make. He's thought out most, if not all, possible outcomes for each decision, but uses Game Theory to determine which scenarios are are most likely to happen and spend the most time developing those outcomes. Yes, it is more complicated than that, but as I've said before, we don't do math here in the horror history classroom, so I'll leave it in the simplest terms. John's understanding of game theory is the reason he was able to sidestep Cecil, the reason that he could count on Zepp to show up in the bathroom, and the reason that he was comfortable putting his life on the line at the Wilson Steel Plant. When Matthews loses his game, John has already predicted that Matthews will do what benefits him most in the moment by threatening John and forcing him to give directions to the nerve gas house. John uses the fact that Matthews was thinking independently from the rest of his unit to his advantage. While John takes him to the real nerve gas house, the police tech team follows the video signal to another house, where the pre-recorded videos are being played back from. Remember how I theorized that there were several houses, all part of John's urban renewal project? I think the fake out nerve gas house is just another one of those houses. When John and Matthews arrive at the real house, John is hanging onto his life by a thread and hands over a key, not disclosing that this would be the key that locks in Eric Matthews' fate. You are locked away, helpless, and alone. Game over. That's my favorite one, if you can't tell. Amanda attempted to leave Eric Matthews for dead, but Jigsaw, seemingly seeing great potential in the guy and perhaps sensing that he was close to getting through to him, decided to give him one more chance. He saved Matthews and kept him in a holding cell for the next six months. During this period, John realizes that he's running on borrowed time. He knows his days are extremely numbered at this point, and still has many targets that he wants to punish. Most importantly though, he still needs to decide which of his disciples, now consisting of Amanda Young, Mark Hoffman, and Lawrence Gordon, would continue his work after his death. He created games for each of them as a final test. Amanda's game was planned to take place with John on his deathbed, while Hoffman's would be a post-mortem challenge. It's not clear if Gordon's final test was detailed in the films. It could be that the preparations that he helped with for some of the other traps were part of his final test, or it could be that it happened off screen. He also hopes to get his ex-wife back on his side by showing her that his rehabilitation methods had saved Amanda, even when the medical approach at Jill's clinic could not. I brought proof that it worked. But there are way more planned traps and games that Jigsaw didn't have time for in his lifetime. 
He records a tape for his ex-wife Jill and leaves it for her in his will, instructing her to carry out a game to help balance the power of Jigsaw when he's gone. This included Hoffman's final test, but also five others, who were a part of William Easton's Umbrella Health, the insurance company that had prohibited John from seeking out alternative treatments to his cancer. The box he leaves behind is locked so that nobody without the key could get into it, and he would hold on to the key for a while longer. He also pre-records the tapes that would play during the games and traps for other people, like Detective Carey, a repeat offender named Troy, a SWAT officer Rig, a guy named Trevor who we know nothing about, John's former business partner Art Blank, another pair of tapes for Trevor and Art Blank in case they survive the first one, a pimp named Brenda, an evil motel manager named Ivan, a pair of abusive parents named Rex and Morgan, an FBI agent named Lindsay Perez, another FBI agent named Peter Strom, five citizens who all played a part in a building fire scandal, a malicious moneylender named Simone, a malicious moneylender named Eddie, a sensationalist reporter named Pamela Jenkins, a love triangle consisting of three young people, Brad, Dina, and Ryan, a gang of four rap metal loving racists, and the man who once tried to pretend to be a Jigsaw victim would finally become one, Bobby Dagan. Keep in mind, Jigsaw didn't assume the outcome of any game, so he also probably had multiple tapes for each person to take all of the possible results into account. In addition to all of that, he left one final set of instructions that Jill was supposed to hand off to Dr. Gordon. Watch over Jill, and should anything happen to her, I want you to act immediately on my behalf in return for that. I will keep no more secrets from you. I hope old Johnny charged up some extra camera and audio recorder batteries because that's a lot of recording going on for Jigsaw. But not as much recording as I've had to do to make this video, so with that in mind, I think it's only fair that I take a little break before we get to the final game of John's life. It is likely that John knew the games taking place in April of 2006 would be his last, regardless of the outcome. Two games would take place that day. The one involving Rig, Blank, Matthews, and Hoffman was designed by John, but would be carried out by Hoffman, while the other game involving Lynn Denlin, Jeff Denlin, Amanda Young, and John was created by John and would be facilitated by John. The game was originally going to feature Jeff Denlin going through a series of trials to try to forgive people involved in a road accident that resulted in his young son's death. The idea was that if he made it to the end of the game, he'd be forced to confront Amanda, who was implied to be his captor. Jeff's restraint would be tested by choosing whether or not to kill Amanda upon reaching the end, while Amanda's restraint would be tested by making sure she didn't sabotage Jeff's trial as she did to some of her other victims in the past. Jigsaw was worried that Amanda was only involved because she enjoyed punishing the victims, and did not want to see them actually succeed, pass their tests, and rehabilitate as she supposedly had. Seeing Amanda sabotage her recent traps to make them unwinnable disturbed John, and may have made him start to lose faith in his methods, or at the very least, lose faith in Amanda. The entire operation he had built was founded on the idea that Amanda had been the first one to be rehabilitated, the prime example of how suffering can cause a person to be reborn and lead a better life. He considered Amanda to be the closest person to truly understanding him, so he would probably be quite defeated if she were to fail her final test now, after two years of training. To make matters worse, she seemed to be developing a rivalry with the other known prospective candidate to continue John's work, Detective Hoffman. Hoffman's training with John was also ongoing, and John did his best with the limited time he had to teach Hoffman to walk the fine line that Jigsaw is supposed to walk. He must respect the lives of those test subjects he captured, but also prepare to see them suffer, in order to achieve retribution for their sins. The day these games were held was on April 28, 2006. Before the fun begins, John's ex-wife shows up at the meatpacking plants to try to plead with him to get him to stop his work. Instead of listening to her, he gives her the key to the box left to her in his will, and tells her she'll know what to do with it when the time comes. With that, John feels he's done everything he can do, and asks Amanda to take him to his deathbed. His final game was about to begin, and his assistants went to go retrieve the players, Dr. Lynn Denlin and the morning father, Jeff Denlin. Hoffman got done capturing Jeff and placing him at the start of his trial moments before Amanda got back with Lynn, and he used this time to have one last meeting with John. It turns out that Hoffman shared the same concerns about Amanda, letting her emotions get in the way of her giving her victims a fair chance to survive. John rewards Hoffman for his honest work so far by giving him a protection that Amanda does not have, anonymity. Amanda was already a known accomplice to Jigsaw. The police and FBI would have figured that out when they saw her help Daniel Matthews out of the nerve gas house, since Daniel ended up being stowed in Jigsaw's workshop. The FBI did suspect there was another accomplice, but did not know with certainty that it was Hoffman. So John's willingness to keep Hoffman's involvement a secret showed that he had more faith in Hoffman than he had in Amanda. In exchange for keeping this anonymity, he does ask Hoffman to carry out one more task and hands him a file with instructions on a future game, which would test Ashley Kuzan, Charles Salomon, Britt Stevenson, Scott Malik, and Luba Gibbs, who all played some part in causing and covering up a deadly fire. What's this? It's time to play a game. 
Those would be the final words John said to his longest tenured student, who slipped out a secret door before heading over to the room where the final trial of Daniel Rigg would take place. Moments later, Amanda arrived with Lynn Denlin, so their own game was about to begin. Hello, Dr. Denlin. John explains that he was once her patient, and blames her for telling him that he's gonna die in such a cold, clinical tone of voice. He claims that she's dead on the inside, after leaving her husband and neglecting her daughter. But when John delivers his second most used phrase from his list of top 10 phrases, What do I want? I want to play a game. He's actually looking at Amanda, signifying that this is her test as much as it is Dr. Denlin's. This would be her final chance to prove that she can let a game play out fairly without her desire for revenge and bloodthirst getting in the way. I mean, obviously there's nothing fair about any of Jigsaw's games, but you get what I mean. When John states the rules, he simply says he is testing her will to keep someone alive, which could apply to both Lynn and Amanda. Lynn is required to keep John alive, and Amanda is required to keep Lynn alive. If John dies, his heart rate monitor will stop, causing Lynn's shotgun collar to shoot her in the head. Whereas if Lynn dies, Jeff will come through the door at the end of his trial and get revenge on the first person he sees, Amanda. The theme of the game is forgiveness. Can a father forgive the people involved in the premature death of his son? Can Amanda forgive the victims who had faltered in life as she once had? And can Lynn Denlin forgive the man responsible for kidnapping her entire family by doing her best job to keep him alive as long as possible? As usual with the Jigsaw, each of these people were pieces of his puzzle, and they would all interlock together at the end. His confidence that each of them will end up coming together is another example of his mastery of game theory. Amanda would keep tabs on Jeff's progress as Dr. Denlin began to treat John. She believes John's brain is herniating, and suggests that they take him to a hospital. And John watches helplessly as Amanda loses her cool and goes off on the doctor, basically telling her that she needs to perform an operation in this room. Normally, Jigsaw would not really interfere with anything that might change the result of his games, but in this instance, he snaps at Amanda. I think that's because she was the only one that had seemingly recovered from her addictions. She was the only ray of hope that could make John believe that his treatment methods actually worked. So he desperately wanted her to pass her test, so that he could die thinking that he had actually been helping his test subjects all along. Of course, John was completely delusional at this point. He hadn't actually helped out anybody other than himself, and it would soon show much more quantifiable signs of his deteriorating sanity. But his sanity wasn't the only thing that had slipped, because moments later, he would go into a life-threatening Myclonic episode. John must have been very aware that he was getting close to the end of his life, because it was very shortly after bringing Lynn Denlin into the picture that he convulsed into a dangerous state that required the combined efforts of Dr. Denlin and Amanda to get the oxygen flowing back to his brain and save his life. John was left very weak after this, but refused to let that stop him from continuing to work on his legacy. He may have been crazy, but I gotta admire his work ethic. Just like you should admire my work ethic to get you to buy this merch. You can click the link in the- I think it was while Lynn and Amanda were out arguing in the next room when Jigsaw recorded the tape for Detective Hoffman to find after his death. Of course, he couldn't guarantee that Hoffman would be the only one to hear it, so he had to speak in very general terms, not revealing the fact that they were actually working together. Are you there, Detective? If so, you are probably the last man standing. Now perhaps you will succeed where the others have failed. You think you will walk away untested? I promise that my work will continue. John placed this tape next to his bed, and as Lynn prepared for the next operation, Amanda came in to inform him that Jeff had passed through the first room of his trial. John let Amanda know about an envelope that he had Hoffman hide in his desk. We never find out what this note was supposed to say. It was most likely supposed to offer Amanda some strength and words, but Hoffman switched out the message. If you want to know more about that, you can watch the Hoffman and Amanda Horror History episodes. When he sees Amanda becoming overwhelmed with emotion, he once again tries to intervene to get her back on the right path. This is another example of his blind ambition to prove that his rehabilitation process works, despite all evidence pointing to the fact that it doesn't. The American Psychiatric Association notes that psychotic behavior can include an overinflated self-image and extreme cockiness. It seems that John has reached that stage, and he can't accept that he was wrong about something, especially after spending his last three years holding these games with the intention of proving that his test subjects were missing something, and that torturing them in his traps would help them find it. After Amanda watches Jeff complete the next room, she reports back to John, who is surprised that 
at the rate that he is progressing. But despite his quick advancement, the outcome of the game would depend entirely on what was about to happen next. John gets a haircut, something that I could use right about now. If only you knew. In preparation of the brain surgery that Lynn was about to perform. This would prevent the brain from pushing up against John's skull and theoretically reduce his headaches and improve his motor skills. While it was possible to use numbing agents, John had to be awake and alert for this procedure, which involved Dr. Denlin drilling into his skull and cutting open a window using this little saw blade. Get it? Because saw? That's the name of the franchise. <laughs> Something about this procedure triggers some memories in his brain of a picnic he went on when he was married to Jill, which he had recorded on his camcorder. I'm sure that tape is right there on his shelf at home next to all his other home videos. More comfortable in chains than you are in freedom. During the hallucination, John tries to tell his wife, I love you, but that causes it to look like he's telling Lynn Denlin he loves her, making Amanda get super jealous and causing her to storm out. Just get out of here, you stupid dumb animal! <laughs> Once again, Dr. Denlin's efforts are able to buy John a little more time, and it seems as if she's actually starting to change her attitude. For example, we see her put her wedding ring back on, as if to suggest that seeing John fighting for more time made her appreciate her time with her husband. Amanda is still in jealous girlfriend mode, a very serious mental disease that I discussed in great detail in her own horror history episode, and she comes in and starts kissing John's face and neck. Lynn tells her that John is passed out and can't hear her, and again, Amanda's temper flares up and she threatens to kill Lynn. Once again, Jake Jigsaw has to intervene and scold her? Wait a minute, John. Weren't you supposed to be asleep? So you mean to tell me that you just gained consciousness and had a full understanding of what was going on in the two seconds between when this happened and when this happened? And you were totally passed out and not pretending to be asleep when Amanda was all over you right here. I see you, John Kramer. I see you! <laughs> Meanwhile, Jeff continues on through his trial, eventually making it to the room where he has the opportunity to save his son's killer from what John considers to be his personal favorite trap, the rack. The fact that John even has a favorite torture device is proof that he had developed a psychological dependence on the feeling that he got from hurting others, and this was no longer solely about curing people. The trap is also a modern day crucifix, which adds credence to his god complex and development of his teachings as a religion. Back in the operation room, John asks Lynn to talk about her new husband, causing Lynn to defend her marriage against him, which is essentially what he wants. He wants her to get passionate and take back her life. She begs for him to let her go free, and right as he takes her hand, Amanda walks in, causing more jealous rage. John sends her off. We're fine, Amanda. We don't need you. It does seem a little counterproductive for Jigsaw to do something to piss off Amanda like this when he really wants her to pass her test. It could be that he knew she would have to endure some emotional turmoil in order to prove that she's able to handle her emotions when he's no longer around, but I don't think he was really in the mind of giving his victims proper tests at this point. I think more what was going on is he sensed he was close to a breakthrough with Lynn and didn't want Amanda to interrupt it. Why settle for one successful patient when he could possibly have two? If you make it through this, Lynn, you're going to thank me one day just as Amanda. As he continued to talk with Lynn, he knew that it would not be long before Amanda announced that Jeff had passed through the final room and would soon be headed to the operation room. With this came the possibility that Jeff would try to get revenge on his captor, so it was time for John to hide the tape that he had previously recorded for Detective Hoffman. Since Amanda's safety was also not guaranteed, he covered the tape in a protective coat of candle wax and swallowed it, so that the medical examiners could find it in his stomach and forward it to Detective Hoffman. Sometimes when people know that they're gonna die, they get their favorite food as a final meal. John gets to have an audio tape covered in wax, so... The less we eat, the more the less fats we get at ourselves. Not long after, Amanda would come into the room to deliver the message that Jeff had completed his final test. This meant that Lynn had kept John alive long enough to pass her test, and he orders Amanda to let her go free. Only Amanda has... other ideas. I said no. The Jeff Denlin trials, as with the barn game, the bathroom game, and the nerve gas house game before it, end when the pieces of the puzzle, the people involved with those being tested, come together. And as with the bathroom game, this time they all literally come together in the same room. Amanda's temper and jealousy had once again gotten the better of her, and she refuses to let Lynn go free after passing her test. John knows he cannot directly say what will happen if Amanda kills Lynn, but he does give a warning that Lynn's life is important because she controls the outcome of Amanda's life. That ends up making Amanda even more 
more upset, and John tries to justify it by bringing up the victims that Amanda had murdered, how he had cleaned up her mistakes and forgiven her, but how he will not allow her to go on as a murderer. Amanda argues that Lynn could not have rehabilitated because nobody that they had tested ever really changed. She proceeds to shoot Lynn Denlin, and when she does, Jeff is there to see it. In retaliation, Jeff fires back and kills Amanda. With Lynn dying on the floor, Jigsaw has one final test for Jeff. The lesson he had been trying to teach throughout this entire endeavor was to forgive. While Jeff had shown signs of forgiveness in each stage of his trial, he was unable to save any of the people involved in the accident that resulted in his son's death. Now he would be faced with one more decision, to exact his revenge on the man responsible for putting him and his wife through even more hell, or to let Jigsaw live in exchange for a chance to save Lynn's life. After much deliberation, Jeff makes his choice. I forgive you. But in this case, forgiveness is not enough. Even John, in the face of death, cannot help but smile when Jeff fires up the circular saw blade. I think the irony of this twist was not lost on him. After all the people who he had made suffer, it would be one of his most tortured test subjects who would reverse that suffering back onto him. And with a circular spinning saw blade no less, the very same type of weapon he had used upon his victims in the very first portion of his first game at the barn. It's almost like that baseball game I brought up earlier, where Aroldis Chapman gave up the ALCS clinching home run and all he can do is give this weird smile. Because he knew that Altuve waiting on an off-speed pitch was no coincidence. With his very last bit of life, John rolls Jeff's tape. Hello, Jeff. I made this tape as an insurance policy, if you will. I was your final test of forgiveness, and if you are listening to this, then you fail. Now you must pay the price. The tape reveals that Jeff's other child, Corbett, is locked away somewhere and that only John knows the location. By killing Jigsaw, Jeff had essentially locked the tomb of his own daughter. Even if John had lived, there's no excuse he could have made to his followers for trapping an innocent young girl just to punish Jeff. So on the evening of April 28th, 2006, John's heart rate monitor flatlines, and the man feared by an entire city as the Jigsaw killer is no more. With his death, Lynn's collar goes off, and Jeff is locked inside the operation room for life. After years of insistence that his methods worked, John died knowing that he had failed. In early May, they would perform the autopsy on John's body, and inside his stomach, they found not only John's Cocoa Puffs, but also the tape left for Detective Hoffman, who would continue to fill the shoes of Jigsaw until March of 2007. John's body was buried in a local cemetery, where it would remain until the year 2016, when his first disciple, Logan Nelson, dug up his casket and switched the body with that of Edgar Munson. It is unknown where Kramer's body currently resides. Throughout this video, we have discovered the different puzzle pieces that make up the life of John Kramer. Just as he played games with his victims, his own life, Life, in a way, was a game where each of these pieces came together to form an icon named Jigsaw. After a life of his own agony, he gave himself the power to judge the lives of others, and as a result, developed a dependence on human suffering. This caused him to become a psychopath, the likes of which rival the greatest serial killers in all of fiction. He developed a god complex, and transformed his work from a series of acts of violence into a movement, a religion with its own symbols, code of conduct, and followers. He claimed to offer all of his subjects a second chance at life, but in reality, he destroyed the lives of over 50 people, some of which were bad criminals, and some of which were completely innocent. He was able to get as far as he did based on two things that he did very well. The first was his engineering degree. He was a mechanical mastermind, making his trap perfect machines that were only escapable in ways that he intended. The second was his ability to anticipate the human mind. He was a master of game theory, so every conceivable possibility for each game, and really anything he did in life, was already thought out and had a solution. And what does that leave us with? An almost finished puzzle. Because with all of John's intellect and ability, he was never any better than any of the people that he tested. Jigsaw was missing a vital piece. If you're a fan of Saw, click the playlist on the left to see my horror history analysis of other Saw characters. And if you love horror, make sure you subscribe to CZ's World for new horrors every week. Ring the death bell for notifications, and I'll see you in the next one. Assuming we both survive.